What's up designers and welcome back to Rempton Games. When designing cards for a trading card game, it's important to be able to design fun, powerful cards, but it's equally important to know what cards not to design. In today's TCG Design Academy, we're going to be looking at some of the most broken cards, decks, and combos from various trading card games and learning what makes them tick and why they're so broken. We'll also be looking at how you can learn from these examples to avoid making the same mistakes in your trading card game. Really quickly, before we look at what makes a card broken, we want to answer a simpler question. What does it even mean to be broken in the first place? Yes, broken cards tend to be extremely powerful, but it's more than that. Broken cards tend to warp the entire metagame around themselves. A broken deck might be so much stronger than the alternatives that it makes every other deck obsolete. And a broken card might be so powerful that every other deck has to plan around it of how they're going to deal with it or be easily defeated. Broken things also tend to be unfun, promoting degenerate, boring, or uninteractive play. There's nothing wrong with powerful cards, but a truly broken card can damage the health of an entire game and usually requires the makers of the game to intervene by banning or modifying the card. While it's not always possible, it's usually best to try to catch broken cards before they go out into the wild. Luckily, most broken cards tend to fit into a few repeating categories, which we're going to look at in order from least dangerous to most threatening. The first category is raw power. Simply put, raw power means that a card does more than other cards of a similar cost. Whether that be more damage, drawing more cards, more destruction, etc. A good example of this is the card Ancestral Recall from Magic the Gathering. It's one blue mana to draw three cards. Typically, drawing three cards is going to cost you four or five mana, so getting the same effect for only one is super powerful. The thing about raw power is it's actually probably the least dangerous category of broken cards, as well as the easiest to avoid. Simply by comparing a card to other similar cards at the same price, you can usually get a good idea of when you're getting too much bang for your buck. In addition, while these cards tend to be very powerful individual cards, they don't tend to warp entire formats around themselves in the same way as some of the other categories on this list. Getting higher numbers is nice, but it's typically not going to win you the game all by itself. The next category is the infinite combo, which is when a couple of cards work together to create an infinite loop that ends up winning you the game. One example is the copycat combo, which involves the planeswalker Sahili Rai and the card Felidar Guardian. Sahili has the power to copy any artifact or creature until the end of the turn. Felidar Guardian causes a card to blink, to disappear and reappear instantly. You start the combo by playing Sahili and Felidar Guardian, and using Sahili's ability to copy the Guardian. The new copy then blinks Sahili, which allows her to use her ability again. This combination can potentially go on forever, and creates infinite copies of the Felidar Guardian. Because these copies have haste, you can attack that same turn for potentially infinite damage. This combo was efficient and effective enough that Wizards of the Coast ended up putting out an emergency ban on Felidar Guardian, something they've only done a handful of times throughout Magic's history. To prevent this kind of situation, you should try to identify combo pieces and ask yourself, what would it take for this card to go infinite? For example, suppose you're designing a creature that has the power to summon itself from the graveyard. Now all you need is a way to repeatedly get that creature back into the graveyard and you can go infinite. If we have a way to benefit from this interaction, such as an ability that triggers either when the creature enters the battlefield or when it goes to the graveyard, then we can quickly win the game. Because of the sheer number of possible interactions between different cards in a trading card game, it's probably impossible to catch every potential infinite loop, and here's the secret. That's totally fine! Most trading card games have the potential for infinite loops built into them, but most of them are too expensive, complicated, or inefficient to really be a problem. It can be fun to build your Rube Goldberg machine of cards, but most decks built around these kinds of combos are too fragile and don't really have an effect on the metagame. 
The main goal is to prevent the combo from being too easy to pull off. If you find a particular combo piece that you think might be too dangerous, you can always try limiting the effect in some way. Perhaps it can only activate its effect once per turn, or maybe it requires additional resources every time it uses it, which makes it more difficult to go infinite. The third category, Engines, are cards that convert one in-game resource, such as creatures, cards, life, mana, etc., into another. For example, a card might allow you to draw additional cards every time you gain life, or allow you to sacrifice a creature to deal damage to your opponent. Engines tend to be vital components of infinite loops, but these cards can also be pretty dangerous all by themselves. A great example of this is Necropotence, a magic card that probably doesn't actually seem that broken on its surface. It prevents you from drawing cards normally, but allows you to draw cards at the end of your turn by paying one life per card. It turns out, one life per card is an extremely efficient rate. It makes basically any deck more consistent, and it's especially effective in combo-based decks because it allows you to quickly find all of the pieces for your combo. Because of this, Necropotence is banned in numerous formats, and is considered one of the most powerful cards around in any format where it is legal. Engine cards are pretty easy to identify, but can be tricky to balance. They may seem pretty balanced when looking at the average case scenario, but the thing you have to keep in mind is that your players are always going to find a way to squeeze the maximum possible value out of these cards, so really you need to look at the worst case scenario. For Necropotence, for example, the worst case scenario is a player sacrificing most of their life to draw through a huge chunk of their deck in a single turn with no extra mana, which is definitely overpowered. On the other hand, there are plenty of engine cards that don't cause problems. The key thing to keep an eye on is the exchange rate between one resource to another. It's basically impossible to get a perfectly evenly balanced exchange rate from one sort of resource to the other, and if your player is getting more than they pay for every time they activate the engine's effect, then it can pretty easily turn into an infinite value machine. If in doubt, err on the side of giving players a bit less than they're paying for. Because the engine can be used infinitely, it's okay if it's a bit less efficient than other options. Now we're starting to get to the more dangerous stuff. Lockdowns are any card, combo, or deck that's designed to prevent your opponent from taking specific actions in the game. In any case, lockdown cards should be designed sparingly because, surprise, the players tend to actually want to play the game they're playing, and cards that prevent them from doing so tend to be pretty unfun. A total lockdown, one that stops the players from taking any actions, can completely suck the fun out of the game for the player on the receiving end, and if these types of lockdowns become too prevalent, they can really damage the health of the game. Furthermore, because lockdowns by their very nature prevent counterplay, Typically, the only way to respond to a lockdown that becomes too popular is for the designers of the games to ban those cards. One example of a very broken lockdown combo is the infamous Yada Lock from Yu-Gi-Oh! This lock used the effect of Chaos Emperor Dragon to destroy all cards on the field and discard all cards from both players' hands. That's already a pretty broken effect, but it was used in combination with a monster, such as Sangan, that allowed the player to search their deck for a creature card when it was destroyed. The player searched for Yadagarasu, which prevents the opponent from drawing cards if they take damage from it. Because the opponent has no way to stop them, because they have no cards on the field and nothing in their hands, the player can just keep attacking with Yadagarasu turn after turn, preventing the opponent from drawing any cards until their life points are completely gone. This lockdown is particularly brutal because Yadagarasu has extremely low attack points, so actually defeating the opponent using this method can take quite a while if they don't simply forfeit first. The Yadalock was so prevalent and degenerate that not only did all of the cards involved end up getting banned, but it might actually be responsible for the existence of Yu-Gi-Oh's ban list in the first place. When it comes to balancing lockdowns, there honestly isn't too much to do. I would never advise intentionally designing a total lockdown, 
and if you're able to identify one ahead of time, I would take it very seriously. Much like an infinite loop, it might be okay to let some lockdowns through, but unlike a loop that kills the opponent instantly, a lockdown can lead to a slow, agonizing death for the opponent, so I would definitely recommend adding additional restrictions to prevent the lockdowns from being complete. One of the only cards to ever be banned in Hearthstone's Wild format was a cost avoidance card called Stealer of Souls. It has the ability to change the cost of any card you draw to require health instead of mana. Now, every draw spell basically becomes an engine that turns life into free cards. However, in Hearthstone there were actually ways to prevent this loss of life, which basically allowed you to play any card you drew for free. Now that's what I call busted. Similarly, the entire point of the vintage format in Magic the Gathering is to give players access to all the cards, and even cards that are typically considered to be baroken, like Ancestral Recall and Black Lotus, are allowed in the format. The only card to ever be banned in vintage purely for power level reasons is Lurus of the Dream Den which avoids costs in two different ways. First, the card itself allowed players to play cards with a cost of two or less from their graveyard each turn for free. However, the more insidious thing is that it circumvented one of the most fundamental costs of any magic cards. You have to have the card in your deck in order to play it. The entire companion mechanic allowed players to play companion cards from their sideboard instead of their deck if their deck met certain conditions. The condition for Lures is that every permanent card in your deck must have a converted mana cost of two or less, something which a lot of vintage decks already met. This basically allowed them to add the card to their hand for free without even having it in their decks. I think the call on this one is pretty clear. It's busted. It's totally busted. This category is possibly the most dangerous of all. Most trading card games have a resource system, and this resource system is the most fundamental way that the game designers have to balance their cards. Therefore, it's no surprise that many of these cards tend out to be extremely unbalanced because they're literally avoiding the very thing designed to balance them in the first place. In fact, this is one category of cards where they might not just be unbalanced, they might be unbalanceable. If you do insist on designing and printing these kinds of cards, just be very sure that the alternate costs that you're adding to them are sufficient, that they can't be easily avoided, and be sure to learn from your mistakes when you're inevitably proven wrong. Now that we've looked at what I consider to be the five most broken categories of cards, I want to get your thoughts. Is there a type of card or strategy that I missed? Are there better ways to detect or balance these cards? Let me know in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe if you want to see more. It really helps the channel and it lets me know that you want to see more TCG design content in the future. If you are interested in seeing more, I already have a few other videos on this topic which you can check out in the playlist over here. And join me next time for the ultimate ticket to ride strategy guide. Until then, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all next time.